Hello and welcome to our webinar tonight. We'll get started in a couple of minutes. Uh, in the meantime, if you'd like to open up the chat box and let us know where you're joining from tonight, we'd love to know if you're local or maybe we can find out who's the furthest away. We've got a couple of people who've joined from uh, Newcastle. That was our intended audience, but obviously the benefit of doing this virtually is anybody could join. Anybody who has joined just now, we um, we will get started in a couple of minutes. If you want to let me know in the chat where you are joining from, it'd be great to see that. In the meantime, we're going to ask you a couple of quick questions. So a poll is going to come up on your screen. If you want to have a go, have a guess at the answer and uh, see how much you know about batteries. Okay, about half of our audience have voted. I'll just give it another couple of seconds to see how many more answers we get. Okay. So the results of this question, how many AA batteries would it take to charge a mobile phone for a year? So most people thought, or the majority of people thought 800. We'll find out the results in a few moments. Next question. Which are there more of? Dogs in the world, batteries thrown away each year, or cars on the road in the UK? I think we've got a clear winner on this one. So most people thought it is batteries thrown away each year. And another question. Okay, I'll just share those results. So a bit more mixed, but the majority or the most people said five. And then our last poll of the evening. There we go. When was the electric car invented? Okay, 
Okay, we will close that one. So again, a bit of a mix, leaning towards maybe the 1900. Okay. So the furthest away we've got somebody joining from at the moment is Bolton. I wonder if there's anybody further away in the audience. If you are, do let us know in the chat. I'll just uh, close the poll. So, thank you all for joining us tonight. This is the last one in our series of Women in STEM events that have been organised jointly by the Institute of Physics, the Institution of Chemical Engineers, the Institution of Civil Engineers, Palace of Science, the Women's Engineering Society, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Ooh. This series started back in January with six events planned at the Lit and Phil in Newcastle. We only managed to get two of those in before COVID got in the way. This is now our fourth online event. If you haven't been able to get to any of the other online ones, we have recorded all of them. And we're going to make sure that they're all on YouTube, probably by the beginning of, of next week. And they're going to be on the Engineering Together YouTube page. So if you search that, you should be able to find all of our other talks next week. The event tonight has been organised by the Newcastle upon Tyne and North East Coast local section of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Throughout the uh, talk, you can type any questions that you've got into the chat box and I will ask our speaker at the end. The speaker for this event will be Professor Serena Call, who is a professor and chair in functional nanomaterials at the University of Sheffield, a joint appointment between the departments of chemical and biological engineering and materials and science and engineering. Her research focuses on the design, synthesis and characterization of functional nanomaterials, in particular for applications in energy storage and the environment, with an emphasis on understanding their intimate structure, property, interplay. With that, I will hand over to Serena. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I'm delighted to be with you all this evening. Um, and it would be really fantastic to be with you in person, but I just wanted to thank Joe Russell and the RSC local section of Newcastle and the Northeast Coast for making it possible for us to spend this time together this evening online. I wanted to share uh, some uh, research that I've been involved in with you this evening um, in battery materials for energy storage applications. Lithium ion batteries have revolutionized the portable electronics industry and are finding ever increasing applications in electric vehicles and in large scale storage. But before we start with some of the, the science, I thought it might be fun to take you through some of the answers to the poll questions that you've been answering just at the beginning of this uh, webinar. So how many AA batteries would it take to charge a mobile phone for a year? You got this one right, it is 800. So quite a lot of AA batteries required for mobile phones. Which are there more of? Dogs in the world, batteries thrown away each year or cars on the road in the UK? Correctly, you've identified that it's batteries thrown away each year, it's about 3 billion batteries. Um, and I think this really uh, highlights the need for a recycling infrastructure around lithium ion batteries. Thinking about the weight of an electric car battery, how many emperor penguins is this equivalent to? And the answer here is 10. Uh, this was quite a mixed uh, question. So uh, an emperor penguin weighs about 23 kilos. Um, and so you'd need about 10 of them uh, to be equivalent to the weight of an electric vehicle battery, which is about 230 kilograms. In which century was the electric car uh, invented? Uh, this is, it might be a bit of a surprising one. It was invented in the 1800s. Um, and I think most people plumped for the 1900s in this question, but don't feel too bad. When I, whenever I ask this question, most people say 1900. But the 1900s saw the sort of birth of the electric vehicle. Um, and while many car makers nowadays are investing heavily in electric vehicles, electric automobiles are not an entirely new thing. When I was researching this talk, I discovered that in as far back as 1901, 
the US President William McKinley was taken to hospital in an electric powered ambulance having been shot. So in around 1900, electric cars accounted for about a third of all the vehicles that were on the road in the US, only for them to be replaced by gasoline powered engines. So what made them so popular? And I think this uh, quote by Thomas Edison really sort of um, articulates very clearly what, uh, what made electric cars so uh, inviting. He said, electricity is the thing, no whirring and grinding of gears, no dangerous and evil smelling gasoline and no noise. So what I thought I'd do this evening was share with you some of the work that I've had the privilege to be a part of um, at Sheffield in the development of new batteries um, and new materials for battery applications. And before I do, I'll, I'll introduce you to some of the colleagues I have um, at Sheffield. So as, as was said in the introduction, I, I have the enormous privilege of working across two departments at Sheffield. I'm uh, with the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and the Department of Material Science and Engineering. And I think that really uh, speaks to the interdisciplinarity of the battery research field, that it borrows from chemical engineering, material science, chem inorganic chemistry, solid state chemistry, polymer science, computational chemistry. And I'm really fortunate to work in a department where I have access to experts across all of those fields. So I thought I'd just showcase some of the work that's ongoing um, in my faculty of engineering at uh, Sheffield on electrochemical devices for energy, where people are looking at battery cells, all the way from atomistic simulations to particles to packs, also fuel cells, supercapacitors, and storage and power conversion. There's lots of people working on uh, materials and modeling, whether that's from a systems-based approach, looking at grid-scale battery analysis, down to what's happening at the interfaces of some of these electrochemical devices. We have an enormous uh, wealth of expertise in energy material synthesis, and I really hope I'll be able to um, share with you some of my contributions um, and my, my colleagues' contributions to that for solid electrolytes and electrodes, as well as manufacturing and processing you know, doing these things in a lab is really interesting, but doing them at scale is really, really challenging. And we have a large number of researchers in chemical and biological engineering who are looking at scale up complex uh, particles um, and also techno-economic uh, analysis and whole life cycle analysis. So I think you can see from this slide that collaboration really is the key. Um, and I've shown here just a picture of a picture I really love of two collaborators of mine, um, where we were doing some beam time at the uh, European um, Synchrotron Radiation Facility. Um, in this case, we were looking at samples from the Mary Rose. So this is Professor Elner Schofield from the Mary Rose Trust. This is Professor Kirsten Jensen from the University of Copenhagen. And that's me in the background, leaning back a bit because I'm, I'm really heavily pregnant in this photograph. So I'm sort of moving about to get comfortable. But I love this photograph because it sort of it shows the power of collaboration across three different countries, um, and just showing you some some results that we'd obtained at this beam time previously for some battery materials that we've been looking at. I've had real because this is a, a women in STEM event. I thought I might sort of take an opportunity to celebrate some of the women that I've had the, the opportunity to work with, and also tell you a little bit about my own experience. Um, in uh, as a, having a career in academia. So I started off um, doing a BA in chemistry at the uh, Trinity College Dublin in Ireland. Um, and then I followed on doing a PhD um, in the same department with Professor Yuri Gunko, where I worked on magnetic nanoparticles for contrast agents for MRI. I had a teaching fellowship uh, while I was at Trinity and that really awoke in me a love of teaching. And I really knew after that that a career in academia was for me, something where I could combine my love of research with my love of teaching. And so I went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship um, and I was extremely fortunate. This middle photograph here is showing you where I did my postdoc. It was at the University of California in Santa Barbara with Professor Ram Sashadri, where I was looking at metal insulator transitions and metal oxides. And I had uh, real fun here, um, lots of really interesting work, met some fantastic people who I still collaborate with. And the lab was right next to the beach, so it was absolutely fabulous place to work. 
I applied for my first position, um, which I was fortunate enough to get at the University of Kent in 2009. Um, and while I was there, I, I met uh, my now husband, who was at the University of Strathclyde. And so that meant we had the two body challenge to try to overcome, which we managed to do a couple of years later, where I joined the University of Glasgow. Um, and I was there as a lecturer, then a reader and went on to become um, their first female chair uh, professor in energy materials at the Department of Chemistry. Um, and just uh, about two years ago, my husband and I have moved to the University of Sheffield. And this is just showing you uh, a picture of the University of Sheffield here, located in a beautiful part of the country. They were surrounded by hills and countryside. Um, where I'm the chair of functional nanomaterials. So throughout my career, I've, I've really engaged in outreach activities. So I love um, doing um, webinars like this and getting to meet people normally in person, but even online, we can still make connections with each other. I've also engaged in lots of teaching activities. And so for anybody who's in the audience who's thinking about a career in academia um, and how much they enjoy teaching or outreach activities, I just wanted to show you this slide because uh, I think it illustrates, um, well, first of all, how much fun you can have. This is a, a picture of me building a boat out of cardboard in Santa Barbara with a high school student that we then tried to sail in the sea as part of a team building exercise. But also um, that these sorts of activities are really valued by our community. Um, a few years ago, I was awarded the Journal of Materials Chemistry Lectureship um, for my research in, in material science, but also uh, for the promotion of chemistry. So I think all of these things that we engage in are, have a real importance, not just to the people that we, we do them with, but also um, to the rest of our profession who really um, value these activities. So I thought I might take a, a, an opportunity before we delve into some science to talk about balance um, and what uh, we could do as a community to try to achieve balance. Um, at the current rate of change, it will take about 70 years to reach parity of uh, the sexes in chemical sciences. And many of you may be aware of the study at Yale University in 2012, uh, where it was shown that there was some societally induced unconscious bias when employing scientists, that male applicants were favored in cases where CVs were exactly the same, but the names were changed. The RSC itself in 2018 had identified this urgent need for improvement across the chemical sciences with respect to mental health, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and socioeconomic background. Um, I thought I might highlight, particularly these days with the, the lockdown that we're experiencing as a result of the global COVID pandemic, um, that people may be feeling quite isolated. And I, I imagine that um, people are finding this quite stressful. We, we're so used to working together collaboratively in labs, going to conferences, socializing together. And I think a lot of us are missing that. I, I know I am. And even prior to the COVID lockdown, um, over 40% of graduate students were showing signs of stress-related illness. And in one paper that I'd uh, come across, the European Physical uh, journal C paper, this was taken from the acknowledgement section, was written, I would like to urge those within academia in roles of leadership to do far more to protect members of the community suffering from mental health problems, particularly during the most vulnerable stages of their careers. So I think that's, that's hugely telling that uh, somebody had put that in the acknowledgement section of their research article. And I think this is a call to, the, to our community as a whole to take action. Research has shown that gender is a key factor for this, uh, with female researchers experiencing higher levels of stress. So managing stress and, and workload and work-life balance is an equality issue. And tackling these sorts of issues is beneficial to us all. So how might we do that? I thought I'd, I'd just give a list of some possible suggestions where we might as a community just do a little bit more to, to support each other and ensure that we, we try to be the change to bring about um, this, this beneficial change for everybody. I think encouraging and supporting underrepresented groups is, is hugely important um, and helping to build self-confidence so that people feel like they, they've earned their place at the, at the table because they have. 
um, and making sure that we 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 we, re we stress that with people, we make sure that they're aware of that. I think giving greater visibility to role models is important across all um, parts of our, our community. I think it's really important as well that uh, we're very honest about the fact that in academia, as with any other job, there will be failure and there will be knockbacks and that's nothing to be afraid of. These things happen to everybody. We just don't hear about them very often. We hear more about people's successes. Um, also, I think, and this is critical, that we should demand more from our senior academics in positions of influence who could influence policy changes. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, and it's something I certainly um, try to encourage in my own research team, that if people have identified an area that could be better, um, that I, I try to make sure that there's an open door where people can, can view those sorts of, or can, can express those sorts of views and be heard. Um, and I think by doing this, um, we can build the most successful teams because these bring a plurality of views and experiences uh, which are diverse and complementary. Um, I showed a picture here. This is um, myself and my husband, Eddie, and our two kids. This is Patrick and this is Robert, partly because they are in a room behind me and may at any point crash into this room. But um, just again to show um, that having a family does not represent an impediment to, to having a successful career in academia. And that was advice that I had from a senior female academic when I was a PhD student, and it really stuck with me. So I thought I'd show you my research group um, and sort of give my acknowledgements before we, we delve into some of the science, um, as well as um, just give some th thanks to my collaborators you'll see that I, I have the, the opportunity to collaborate with people across the world. So I'm really very, very lucky to do that. Um, I have quite a large research team now of PhD students and postdocs who are extremely hardworking and all of the results that I'm gonna show you today are a result of their hard work um, and efforts. I've also been very fortunate to have um, a funding from a range of different sources. So just to acknowledge the people who have, uh, who have funded our research. So what do we do as a team at Sheffield? Our sort of main focus is on functional nanomaterials, specifically for energy and the environment. So we have a very uh, keen interest in synthesis, uh, particularly in the strategic synthesis of bulk and nanostructured materials. And by trying to um, tr tailor particle sizes and shapes and morphologies, we really try to understand how that might influence their eventual properties. We delve a lot into uh, structure. We try to understand um, the, the, the intimate sort of atomic structure of the materials that we make. Um, and by tweaking those in, in small ways, we might be able to affect their properties. And we, we do an awful lot of property measurements, physical properties, electrochemical properties. And I'll show you some of these during our talk. And all of this is sort of aimed at trying to understand those underpinning structure function property relationships that that are a cornerstone of functional inorganic materials so let me tell you a little bit we'll start with some synthesis um, given that this is sort of a, a, a chemistry based uh, webinar my group has sort of primarily focused on the synthesis and preparation of nanostructured materials now we like small things because very often we find that the properties in nanostructures can differ from the bulk. And this opens up opportunities for new applications that perhaps these bulk counterparts wouldn't be suitable for. So the route, the synthetic route that we apply when we're making materials can have an enormous influence over the subsequent uh, particle morphology or structure. And of course, then that can influence the, the properties of these materials. Now, one route that we commonly apply is the solid state route, where we take two solid materials and we heat them up at very high temperatures for quite prolonged periods of time. And before we do that, we grind them together so that we have this very intimate mixture of starting materials. Because what we're trying to do at these very high temperatures and long reaction times is overcome um, the 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 the, the energy barrier for these solids to move to an interface and react with each other. Um, now, careful consideration of the, the, 
the, the crystal chemistry and, and phase diagrams can really help you in predicting um, research or sorry reaction outcomes for, for these kinds of materials. We're also interested in trying to control morphology um, and we can do that through uh, solvothermal type reactions where you'll take your starting materials in some solvent and we place them in a closed container under um, in a stainless steel um, closed reactor. And then this, when it goes into an oven, you get to elevated temperatures, but also elevated pressures because you have this headspace pressure that's generated through um, increasing the temperature of the, the solvent that you've applied. And you can do kind of clever things with additives, surfactants, the type of solvent that you choose, which means that you can get some control over the morphology of the particles that you generate at the end. And so here I'm just showing you how we've made some nanostructured materials which are electrodes and also some highly crystalline uh, cathode materials. We also apply co-precipitation as a technique for a large-scale synthesis of materials and this is, uh, involves a sort of simultaneous occurrence of, of nucleation, growth, uh, agglomeration um, which, and, uh, of which the, the nucleation and the growth phases of these reactions really dictate the final particle morphology and size that you get. And so we take some mixed solutions of our precursor materials and we try to control how these precipitate from solution. So things like the pH, the stirring speed, the temperature, uh, the, 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 the gaseous environment within which you do your co-precipitation reaction are all crucial for trying to tailor the morphology of the materials that you make uh, in your reaction. And so I'm showing here uh, some images of uh, a current state-of-the-art cathode, which is called NMC811. We'll return to this in, in a few slides' time, but this is lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide. And the 811 is just telling you the relative ratio of all those transition metals in that final product. And you can see that through ju judicious choice of reaction conditions, we can either prepare these large aggregates of material or we can prepare these individual single crystals of, of these high nickel content cathodes. When we think about um, synthesis in our research group, um, sometimes we would like to try to avoid multiple reaction steps and try to drive down reaction times and temperatures so that we might avoid these long calcination times um, or that we may wanna to try to tune the morphology in a kind of um, strategic way. And so here I'm just showing you two different examples where in the first example, we're tuning the precursor stoichiometry. Um, and this is the precursor here that I'm showing you where we've reacted this um, sodium tertiary butoxide with an iron or a manganese bromide to get under inert conditions on a Schlenk line to get this sort of precursor, which contains within it all the transition metals that you want in your final product. Um, and what that does is it allows you to reduce the reaction times that you might require for everything to react with each other by, by making these kinds of precursors where all starting all, all metals that you want in your final product are in the one place, you overcome those sort of diffusion energy costs that you would need um, when you do things using sort of traditional methods where you take several different starting materials. And so we can drive down reaction times and temperatures just to a matter of minutes. Um, so 10 minutes and 240 degrees C to generate a range of olivine based cathode chemistries. We can also think about the precursor morphology. Um, and so for example, here I'm showing a nanostructured lithium phosphate precursor. Um, which my postdoc Haniel Shinawi has developed um, just through solution-based chemistry. And then by treating this with the transition metal that you really want to have in your final product, you can maintain that nanostructured morphology in your final product because the heating regime is not too high. Um, and this affords materials which show very, very promising electrochemical performance in terms of batteries. We've also looked at um, uh, uh, precursor materials, these sort of uh, heterometallic precursors, where we can not just have our transition metals in that precursor, but also um, the alkali metal that you may want for your battery. So we can make these precursors containing either sodium, or if we start with a lithium analog, we can make the, the lithium precursor as well. 
And by again uh, treating these um, by hydrolysis and heat treatment, um, those labile metal oxygen bonds can break quite easily and we can form our reactions in very, very short times. Um, and also by applying different heating regimes, for example, the use of microwaves, we can avoid uh, additional side reactions and we can avoid uh, situations where metals may sit in the incorrect atomic position. So for example, in these lithium iron phosphate materials, which, which I'm showing here, you have these channels through which lithium ions can move during charge and discharge. And sometimes you can have the iron ion sitting in a lithium channel. And when it does that, it blocks the channel for, for charging. And we call that an anti-site defect. But by applying these microwave heating methods, we can avoid those anti-site defects because our reactions are very, very fast. And we afford very highly crystalline materials with very few defects. And what this graph here is showing is that for these particles that are made using these precursors plus microwave heat treatment, we get very close to the theoretical capacity of these materials, which is just above 170 milliamp hours per gram. That's what these numbers here on the y-axis are showing. These C numbers here are telling you about how fast you are charging or discharging your batteries. This is called the C rate. Um, and as we progressively get to larger numbers, we're charging and discharging that battery faster and faster. And what's really nice to see about this method is that even at very high C rates of 10C, we're seeing quite high discharge capacities for these materials. So we think that this, this route using heterometallic precursors and microwave heating is really beneficial for the electrochemical properties of the, the materials that you make. So I mentioned these anti-site defect idea, this, this idea where maybe your atoms aren't behaving as well as they could, they're sitting in the wrong spot. How do I know that? So how do we assess the structure of our materials? Well, if we have a nice, beautiful, bulky material that we've made using ceramic solid state roots, we might get these nice, you know, if you look at this micrograph, these large crystalline particles. And from that, we can get a beautiful X-ray diffraction pattern um, with all these lovely Bragg reflect reflections, which are telling us about the, the atomic structure of that material. Um, but what about materials where we don't have this long range order that you need for, for your X-ray diffraction pattern to result? What about a material that's nanostructured um, and doesn't have long range order, so you, you, you can't get those beautiful Bragg reflections? And here I'm just showing an example of a, an AL203 nanosheet and this is what the X-ray diffraction pattern looks like. You've got these very broad, let me change my pointer to a laser pointer. You've got these very broad reflections. Um, um, and when you look at the electron microscopy, these are very, very thin sheets. So long range order is not persisting. Well, we can use other methods, for example, total scattering. Um, and the total scattering method uh, gives you a weighted histogram of all the atom-atom distances that are present in your material. And it's a really powerful technique because it collects not just the Bragg reflections, but also the diffuse scattering that you may get from materials where long range order doesn't persist. So for example, things like nanomaterials or things like amorphous materials like glasses. So how does it work? If we take a look at this central atom here, pretend that you're standing here and you look around you, you've got these three nearest neighbors. And when you look at your PDF or your, your, um, your, your total scattering pattern, you end up getting a peak corresponding to that nearest neighbor distance. And as we move out from that central atom to the next nearest neighbors and the next nearest neighbors after that, we start to see that we build up a picture in real space of what this material looks like. So this is incredibly powerful because if any of these atoms were to deviate from those positions, we would see that reflected in the total scattering PDF uh, pattern that results. And here I'm just showing you what some real data look like for a series of cathode materials where we're able to assess things like the, the phosphorus oxygen atom atom distance, the iron oxygen atom atom distance. And by fitting these, You'll see that the data here are given in blue circles. The fit is in a line, uh, an orange line. And then the difference between the fit and your, your data is given in this, this gray line at the bottom. By doing these fits, we can start to 
quantitatively understand um, or build up a quantitative picture of the defect, sorts of defects that may exist in these materials and really start to pair that up with uh, our electrochemical data and start to understand what might be impeding lithium diffusion in these materials. So there exist challenges um, when you are thinking about some of these uh, battery type materials. When you picture a battery, you think of something that's highly dynamic, things are changing all the time, there's lots of in interfaces, quite a challenge to try to um, monitor operando or while it's, while it's working. One, one way in which we can, we can do things is we can stop a reaction, take things out, take a look at it with X-ray diffraction and see how the structure might be changing. And while that's really nice for you know, our undergrad lab reports where you know, we, we would have taken some measurements and they followed the expected line, this isn't always the case when it comes to real life monitoring of battery materials. And when you stop these things from cycling and, and you, you take them apart to, to try to interrogate their structure, you may have given them some time to have a little bit of a relax. Um, and perhaps you're not quite seeing what might be happening under real operating conditions. So to try to do that in our lab, we, we employ a wide range of, of techniques, um, including uh, X-ray diffraction, but we also make use of central facilities. And in the UK, we are incredibly lucky to have access to places like the Diamond Light Source and the Isis Neutron and Muon facility, where we can really interrogate materials um, to, on a very, very, um, in very high resolution, um, so that we can really understand what's happening from a, a, an atomic level um, or a nanoscale level. Um, and by understanding those processes, we may be able to, first of all, understand what's stopping things from, from, from behaving optimally, and then design materials where perhaps we might improve performance. And so I've just shown you an example here of a nanostructured compound called H2V308, which we've studied using um, X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And in X-ray absorption spectroscopy, we are able to look at, um, we can tune our incoming X-rays to probe um, a desired element. And in this case, we want to probe vanadium because when our battery charges and discharges, and I'll show you this in a, in a few minutes, it does so because or it's facilitated by oxidation state changes in the transition metal. And what X-ray absorption spectroscopy allows us to do is to monitor the changes in those oxidation states. And that's what this beautiful graph here is showing, that as that oxidation state of vanadium changes to accommodate lithium in its structure, we see that the, the edge um, in our X-ray absorption spectrum changes as well. And we can also pull out things like the extended um, fine structure. And this allows us to look at, again, atom atom distances in this case, the vanadium oxygen bonds or the vanadium vanadium bonds. And we can look to see how these change to accommodate lithium during charge and discharge. So what challenges are there still to overcome in, in batteries? And, and what am I going to tell you about that we're trying to work on today? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a large, large number of challenges to overcome, but here are just a few. Um, one is uncovering the structures at interfaces. An awful lot of what's happening in the battery is governed by what's happening at the interface. Um, you have these electrolyte electrode interactions um, where you've got the movement of these lithium ions. Um, you may have structural changes occurring. Uh, you may have reactions between the, the chemical reactions between the electrode and the electrolyte that gives rise to something called an ele a solid electrolyte interface. And trying to understand the nature of that is really tricky because these are very difficult things to interrogate. And how that evolves over time is still an, a, a question that remains to be fully answered. Also, um, trying to determine the role of protective coatings. For example, if you take your cathode material and you want to try to avoid some of these reactions that happen at the interface, can you um, put a little coating on the surface that might protect your electrode from these maybe damaging reactions during cycling? Understanding the role of disorder as well is, is, is a question that's becoming more and more important with the advent of new types of chemistries for lithium ion battery cathodes. So I mentioned these, these defects that you might get in, in olivine based cathodes, but you also have these, you know, this new class of disordered rock salts which have very, very high capacities, 
Um, but the, the role of disorder in how those capacities can manifest and, and continue with prolonged cycling is still not fully understood. And these are questions that some of our team are trying to answer. Also trying to come up with safe batteries um, and, and safer alternatives to, to organic electrolytes that are currently applied um, through the use of solid state electrolytes. Um, and trying to understand how lithium dendrites may form in these types of battery geometries. This is where if you use lithium metal as an anode, which we currently can't do because um, it, it can be highly reactive with, 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 the, with liquid electrolytes. And of course, there's some flammability issues. But if we were to employ a ceramic solid state electrolyte uh, in place of these liquids, we may be able to, uh, to use lithium metal as an anode, and that would improve greatly our en the energy densities that we might be able to achieve. But there's still challenges to overcome in lithium dendrite formation. This is where you get tiny um, growths of lithium, um, almost like little branches of lithium that grow out from the anode across your battery cell, across to the cathode, and of course that may short your battery and cause flammability issues as well. And in all of these, I think, um, we have the importance of operando measurements, being able to um, point us in the right direction for how we may solve some of these challenges. So how does a, a lithium ion battery work? Um, if we think about a, a, a traditional coin cell that might be in uh, the back of a remote control and we, we sort of take a, a look inside that coin cell, we'll see that it's made up of a positive end. We're gonna call that the cathode. A negative end, we're gonna call the anode. And between the two, we have a separator that keeps them apart. And soaking that separator, we have a liquid electrolyte. Now, if I look at that cathode in even greater detail, I'm showing you here what the crystal structure of this NMC type uh, electrode looks like, this lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. And you can see that it's a beautiful layered structure here um, where you've got your transition metal oxide layers. And in between those, you have your lithium um, which can move back and forth during charge and discharge. So during charge, this positive uh, electrode, the NMC, can give up some of its, uh, some of its uh, lithium ions. And these will travel through the electrolyte um, across this, just the, the charged lithium ions through the electrolyte across to our negative anode. And in this case, I'm showing graphite as our, our anode. And during this process, this charging process, the battery is taking in and storing energy. And when the battery is discharging, so when we're using our mobile phone or our laptop, those lithium ions are then moving back across the electrolyte to the positive electrode. Um, and that's producing the energy that, 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 or that's giving out the energy that powers uh, our battery. And in both cases, the, uh, the electrons will flow in the opposite direction to which the, the lithium ions are flowing. Um, and those, those electrons are moving in our outer circuit and, and powering our device. Now, electrons don't move through the electrolyte, and the electrolyte impedes the, 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 the travel of electrons so that they can only go around the, the external circuit. It is only the lithium ions or the sodium ions or whatever your, your, the ion that, that's, that's moving, and that is the ion that, that can move through the electrolyte. Now, what are the, the, these challenges about electrolytes? Well, I mentioned earlier that organic polymer electrolytes are currently employed in lithium ion batteries, but that these do have some safety issues with flammability, toxicity, um, some concerns around environmental fr uh, friendliness, but also they limit the voltage that you can use, the, the limit, limit the voltage of the battery because at very high voltages or very low voltages, these electrolytes can react. Um, and that again causes some safety issues. And of course, it will, it will in, uh, reduce the lifetime of your battery. So what can we do to maybe overcome this? Well, we could think about these solid state electrolytes. Um, the advantages of these are that they, they show very high, some of them show very high electrochemical stability. We don't need to have a physical separator between the, the, the anode and the cathode. The, the electrolyte can play the role of that. And it may allow us to access these higher voltages in a much safer uh, manner. The challenge is that when you have a solid electrolyte um, coming up against a, a solid electrode, you're asking these two things to meet and marry and like each other. 
Um, and what might happen at the interface is that they don't particularly get on very well and the lithium mobility across that interface is impeded. Um, and so we have to try to maintain that lithium ion conductivity uh, and try to improve or reduce the, the interfacial resistances that the, the, the lithium ions are, are, are facing at that interface. We also want to make sure that everything is compatible, that it's all very stable. Um, and solid electrolytes have a very limited wettability. Remember liquids, they can, they can get lots of places. So you've got lots of opportunities for your lithium ions to move between your electrolyte and your electrode. So some strategies that we've been de uh, developing at Sheffield have been uh, to overcome these. One is nanostructuring, where we try to take a nanostructure form of our solid electrolyte on the surface of our electrode material. And that will give a much more intimate um, uh, contact between your electrode and your electrolyte and hopefully improve lithium transfer across that interface. And we also look at trying to lattice match compounds. So trying to think about, well, if my electrode and my electrolyte had similar crystal chemistries, maybe that could facilitate faster or more um, facile lithium migration across that interface, rather than taking two very dissimilar materials and having a very complex lithium migration pathway. So, one of the materials that we're really interested in for solid electrolytes are these garnet materials. Um, and so garnets, um, in particular, we're, we're interested in garnet materials that have very high lithium content. Um, now, if something has very high lithium content, um, what can happen is we can open up new lithium conduction pathways, and that can be very important for facilitating fast ion diffusion. We may also decrease the energy that's required for lithium diffusion to occur. And by having more lithium in there, in the structure, we might be able to increase the lithium uh, diffusion dynamics because we've set up these additional repulsions between our increased population of lithium ions and whatever transition metals that we have in our structure. So if we look at our garnet type material, this is what lithium seven, lanthanum three, zirconium two, O12, and um, this is what a, a, a typical garnet structure looks like. But um, this is the low ionic conducting phase of this garnet material. In order to get to the high ionic conducting phase, which we need if we want to try to employ this in a battery, uh, we want to try to stabilize the cubic form of this material. And we can do that by introducing vacancies if we dope this material with a very small amount of aluminium uh, in place of some of this, um, this lithium. And what you can see in this structure now is you've opened up this pathway around which your lithium ions can move, which is very important for improving the lithium conductivity um, of this material. Now we've made these materials using conventional ceramic techniques, which take about three days and white hot temperatures. And now we can make these materials using microwave synthesis, and that reduces our reaction times down to just an hour. Um, and it also reduces, okay, to red hot temperatures, but nonetheless, we have reduced the temperature that you require. We interrogate the structure very carefully. If you look at the formula of this material, it's a, it's a highly complex material. And so it requires not just X-ray diffraction, but also neutron diffraction studies so that we can understand and locate uh, the lithium positions and also the aluminium that's present that's stabilizing that cubic phase. We have a great interest in trying to mention lithium um, diffusion an awful lot in this talk. So we have a, a huge interest in trying to understand the lithium diffusion properties of these materials. And when you look at the literature, um, this lithium diffusion coefficient, which tells you about how fast your lithium ions are moving in your material, if you look across various traditional techniques that are applied, like for example, electrochemical techniques, um, you see that there's a huge range of values that are reported, um, even for the same material. And we've been interested in applying things like uh, muons to try to interrogate lithium diffusion properties. And the reason that we want to use muons is this provides a very local probe for investigating diffusion properties in materials that might perturb that muon environment. So a muon is a, a spin polarized positive particle, 
And we have access to these at the ISIS Neutron and Muon facility, where we work really closely with the team there to try to develop um, this, uh, new ways of using this technique to understand battery materials. What happens during the experiment is your, your spin positive your spin polarized positive muon becomes embedded in your sample where it precesses and it has a lifetime of about 2.4 microseconds after which it decays and that's what this um, diagram here is showing and when it decays it emits a positron in the direction in which its spin was pointing at the moment that it decayed and during this experiment we collect all of these positrons and they tell us about what was happening to the muon at the time it was decaying. So if you imagine that a lithium ion was pushing past this muon um, just before it decayed, you may see some asymmetry in its, um, in its positron uh, decay, which you can then monitor um, as a function of, uh, of temperature. And you can start to extract diffusion properties from those data, including the diffusion rate coefficient and the activation energy. And I'm just showing some, some raw data here that we can obtain at the beamline and some fitted data that give us information about the diffusion properties. So we've done this for our, our um, garnet materials where we've investigated the pathways for lithium diffusion. In the literature previously, there had been some MD simulations which um, agreed very nicely with this. And we use our, um, our muon data to obtain a lithium diffusion coefficient as well as an activation energy um, of around 10 to the minus 11 or 0.19 EV uh, respectively. Now, when we do our impedance analysis, we actually see that the activation energy is much higher at 0.55 electron volts. Why, why is that? Well, it, one of the reasons it could be is because when we use muons, it really and truly is a, a very local probe. You have your muon implanting within your sample, whereas when you have impedance, so your, your muon is experiencing a sort of a, the, the bulk particle uh, diffusion effects. Um, whereas with impedance analysis, we're taking uh, a powder of material and we're pressing a pellet, and we don't always get that right. We, there may be differences in how we press that pellet every time we take a measurement, but you'll start to see very large contributions of grain boundaries to the total resistance. And we think we've seen this for many samples that we've, we've looked at using muons and impedance, and we consistently see the slightly higher activation barrier for lithium diffusion for impedance analysis. So we've, we're interested in, in further developing this, this technique. And if I get time, I'll, I'll show you how we're doing that. But before I do, I, I wanted to give you a, an example of how we're trying to overcome these um, wettability issues through nanostructuring of um, solid electrolytes onto electrodes. An example I wanted to give you was an all solid state lithium sulfur battery. And this is where we're taking um, our active material, which is shown here in orange, um, our solid electrolyte, which is shown in green, but we're also making this sort of electrode electrolyte composite where we coat our electrode with a very thin coating of our solid electrolyte we also mix it with a, a carbon additive um, to improve the electronic conductivity of this composite. And we end up with this sort of three phase composite material at the nanoscale, um, where we have our particles coated with this very thin layer of solid electrolyte. What we've managed to do is uh, synthesize a nanostructured form um, of this cathode material, Li2S. Um, and this was a really nice result. We did this using microwave synthesis and we can get nice control over the, the particle morphology and the size. And by using this kind of nanostructured cathode, we can then apply um, a lithium Li3 PS4 solid electrolyte. And using a, a solution-based approach, we can actually coat these nanostructured particles, uh, cathode particles with this Li3 PS4 uh, solid electrolyte, which isn't uh, detectable by x-ray diffraction because the, the thin coating is so small we don't see a diffraction pattern from it, but we can detect it from e EDX when we map across the entire composite material. And what we find from electrochemical uh, analyses is that we get excellent cycling performance. This is just showing you what the cathode looks like. Um, it, this is the solid electrolyte, this pellet of material. 
um, and we can get really excellent capacity retention. So we don't see our, you know, the, the, the capacity or the amount of the charge that our battery is storing sort of uh, decreasing with time. This is over 450 cycles. And we think this is because we've uh, increased that electrode electrolyte contact area through this nanostructuring approach. And with those sort of very small particles as well, we can have a much shorter lithium diffusion path length through which the lithium ions have to move. So this has been really encouraging. And it's something now that we're applying to other electrolyte systems to try to investigate how applicable this sort of nanostructuring approach is to improving electrochemical performance and this sort of wettability property of our, our solid electrolyte. Next, I just want to give you two very short examples of how we're thinking about crystal chemistry um, and trying to match these cathodes, the, the electrodes with our solid electrolyte and how that might improve the, the ion mobility across the interface. The examples I'm going to give you right now are these NASACON type phases. Here, lithium titanium phosphate, lithium germanium phosphate are very successful materials that are already commercialized um, as um, uh, separator type material or membrane type materials. They're very stable against flame, they're stable in water, but they're not so stable when you put them against lithium metal. And that's because you can get reduction of your transition, your titanium or your germanium four plus. And what you see is the buildup of this sort of material at the surface of your electrolyte, and that increases the interfacial resistance. So your lithium ions are finding it very difficult to get through that interface. So we thought we might move to the more predictably more stable zirconium phase. Um, but so we shouldn't see this sort of uh, reduction of zirconium when we have it against lithium. But the challenge here is that the zirconium phase has a very complex polymorphism to so get lots of different structures of this type of material and it's very hard to densify this material as well so we've been able to stabilize the high ionic conducting phase in a very dense form again by thinking about the synthesis of this material we've used a, a sol gel type chemistry where looking at the quenching temperature and really thinking about it in detail we're able to obtain a very dense material when quenched at 1100 degrees. And if you just change that by 100 degrees, you see that you actually get very porous material. So considering the quenching temperatures for these materials is, is very, very important in achieving high ionic conductivities. In this case, 10 to the minus four Siemens per centimeter at 80 degrees C was the highest conductivity we got for this material. And we haven't had to apply any um, elaborate methods of sintering we haven't had to try to uh, to heat this material in, in 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 any great way to try to get that highly sintered uh, pellet at the end and we think this is because the microstructure the, the materials that we've obtained from this sol gel method when we look at its compatibility with lithium this is a, a an, an example of what a symmetric cell test might look like where you take your solid electrolyte you apply lithium at either side and you see that you don't get any accumulation of interfacial resistance. So this is very stable against lithium metal. So we're not seeing the formation of lithium dendrites in this material over the range that we've tested. But we can also make the titanium analog, the one that, that can react with your lithium um, and that you can get reduction of. And we can use that as a, an electrode material. Um, and by attaching this or uh, depositing this uh, titanium phase on the surface of our zirconium phase, and that we can obtain sort of an all solid state battery where we have our zirconium here in, in gray, which is in black in our colored image. And then on top of that, we've deposited this titanium layer, which is shown in blue in this um, color image down at the bottom. And what we see is when we cycle this against a lithium, a lithium metal anode, we can actually get an appreciable discharge capacity from this battery at 80 degrees C. And this is something that we're, we're optimizing currently in our lab and moving to alternative phases to try to um, take advantage of this crystal chemistry matching. I'd mentioned earlier that we're interested in um, sort of extending our use of muons. And we've been doing that by building in collaboration with the ISIS Neutron and Muon Source and Dr. Peter Baker, who's, who's, who works there, in uh, commissioning a, a new type of battery cell where you can perform uh, muon experiments 
while your cell is charging and discharging. And we've taken this um, zirconium phase as our starting point for these types of uh, experiments. And we can obtain the muon data from the, these materials as we're charging and discharging our cell. We've extended this now out to, to looking at cathode materials, but this is really um, quite exciting because trying to understand how the lithium dynamics change um, as, a, as a function of state of charge is really integral in trying to mitigate what um, degradation processes might happen, for example, at very high voltages. And we could start to understand how the lithium diffusion is occurring at different states of charge. We might be able to prolong the lifetime of our batteries. You can see in this instance, we see that as the battery is discharged up to 1.2 volts, we have an increase in the lithium diffusion rate. But as we go below 1.2 volts, we start to see a decrease in that lithium diffusion rate. And that's because we're starting to damage our material through uh, over discharge. This was a really nice proof, proof of concept uh, experiment. And we're currently optimizing this for interfacial investigations. Can we monitor how lithium diffusion is occurring across an interface? And can we start to look at some of these next generation of cathodes? The last example, and this will just take a couple of minutes, um, I wanted to tell you about something quite recent. And this is using perovskite type materials um, as a, a, a really flexible structure that will allow you to think about how changing the B site cation in this type of structure might allow you to either obtain an active electrode if you pick um, a, a, a metal ion that's, that can undergo redox um, activity or solid electrolyte um, if you start thinking about how you might improve the, the ionic conductivity of these materials. And here I'm just showing you what a, a sort of a, a, a traditional um, double perovskite material might look like. Um, this could be, for example, your lanthanum lithium ruthenium oxide type phase. And a few years ago, Matt Rosinski's group had reported uh, this lithium lanthanum um, uh, tungsten type phase um, for this double perovskite structure. And this is something that we have been, we've been working on in our research group, where we've been thinking about, can we uh, judiciously choose that metal site to be either tungsten, which could be redox active, or tellurium, which might not be, and in one foul swoop have an active electrode and an electrolyte that we could potentially use in, a, in an all solid state battery. So this is the, the formula of the material that we've obtained. And you'll see straight away that the, there is a, 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 an abundance of lithium in this material. The stoichiometry affords um, an A-site deficiency in this material, as well as an extra half a lithium per formula unit compared to what a prototypical lithium double perovskite would look like. We were able to look at the, uh, the, the neutron and the X-ray diffraction patterns of these for both materials, the tungsten analog and the tellurium analog. And we've sort of fully elucidated the structure of these materials, as well as the position of the, the lithium ions. We've also looked at the uh, symmetric cell tests of the tellurium phase, which we've identified as a potential um, solid electrolyte for all solid state batteries. And it shows excellent stability, even at different cycling rates. That's what these graphs here are showing. We're not seeing any big spikes here. We're not seeing any uh, changes in, in behavior which is indicating that we have stability against lithium metal. Um, and we also see uh, very high ionic conductivities for these materials of 0.12 millisiemens per centimeter square per centimeter for this uh, type of perovskite material. Again, we, we love doing our, our muon measurements to try to fully interrogate the lithium diffusion properties. And we've done that for both of our analogs as well as using impedance analysis. And we've electrochemically um, cycled, galvanostatically cycled these the, the tungsten material um, with our uh, tellurium um, solid electrolyte uh, to try to understand the electrochemical performance of this material. So for our, um, our tungsten material, this is using a, a liquid electrolyte, we get um, good capacities out to about 125 um, milliamp hours per gram um, for this as, as an anode material. And when we look at uh, combining our tungsten and our tellurium analog, we can see a very clear redox response in our um, cyclic voltammetry, which is really uh, exciting for us because this is sort of 
um, a, a demonstration of this, cation, this um, crystal chemistry matching across the interface, actually um, allowing for lithium diffusion between these two materials. We've also made the, the sodium analog um, and we're now investigating the using this sort of material as an all so solid state sodium battery material. Um, but we, we're still working on, on the cathode side or the anode side of this um, at the moment in our research group. So I'm, I'm aware now that I, I want to leave some time for questions. Um, and so I'll, I'll just tell you that we are continuing our work on solid electrolytes. We're also doing quite a lot of work on next generation cathodes. Um, and as, as part of that, I, I'm very privileged to lead um, a national consortium that um, through the Faraday Institution for looking at next generation lithium ion battery cathodes. And hopefully the next time we meet, I'll be able to tell you about the results that are coming out of our consortium. We're also looking at you know, this idea of using microwaves to try to obtain materials of high performance. Can we scale that up to high, high throughput microwave synthesis of both cathodes and solid electrolytes? And we're also trying to extend our use of uh, local analyses for operando and in situ investigations to try to understand what's happening across interfaces. And by understanding that, we might be able to manipulate it to uh, improve performance of our materials even more. So with that, I, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to again to the research team who have who've done all of these, uh, th these experiments, my collaborators and um, various funders, and also uh, to thank you very, very much for joining me this evening. It's been a real pleasure. I'm really looking forward to some discussion now. Um, and I'll, I'll hand back to Joe for, uh, to handle the, the questions uh, session. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rita, that was absolutely fab. Uh, just to start us off, do you have any thoughts on sort of the public perceptions around battery materials? I mean, obviously, batteries is something everybody uses, but then there's been, you know, issues around the phones or issues around um, batteries in, in cars that have been problematic. What do you think the public perception is in the minute? So it's a really, really good question. And I think um, there's several aspects to public perception that fundamental research will address. So I think one of the biggest uh, challenges we face is range anxiety, that when people buy uh, an electric car, they want to know for certain that they're going to get from A to B. Um, and that is you know, something that, that's very, very obviously very important. Um, but also um, we want to be able to quell, sort of meet those expectations of people. And it's interesting because when you think about the range of a typical um, car in England just in the last few years, it's around about 6.6 miles for each journey that you take. But mm -hmm. people want to be able to know that if they want to travel 200 miles, they can get there on a single charge and discharge, right? So, or a single charge. So I think by developing new cathode chemistries where you get to those very high energy densities, I think that will uh, meet that demand, that consumer demand, and you'll be able to give people the confidence that uh, that their car can get them from A to B in a reliable way. Also, I think there's going to be an enormous amount of work to be done around the infrastructure that will support this. So, you know, if you're going to drive your car from Sheffield to Glasgow, um, do I have access to all the charging stations I need along the way? Um, or if I were to, to, to need it, where, where are they? So I think there's lots to be, lots of exciting research to be done around that. The safety aspect, of course, is, is a big one. Um, you see, you know, when, whenever there is a, a, a fire caused by, by a battery, it's always, it always gets headline news, which is, you know, right and proper. And I think that uh, the development of coatings for example, for lithium ion batteries where you still use that liquid electrolyte is really important because that can uh, improve the safety performance of your batteries. Also understanding uh, what happens to those batteries um, as they age. So really trying to unpick the degradation mechanisms in batteries and how you might, how that, how that ultimately maps onto the safety of those batteries. There's a huge amount of work being done in Cambridge by Professor Claire Gray on this and um, trying to understand the degradation processes in, in current cathodes and how you might mitigate those degradation processes. And I think also a big role to play will be solid electrolytes where you do have that potential 
stability across a very wide voltage range um, and you might be able to you know ultimately use lithium as a, a, a metallic anode and I think that would that would be fantastic for safety and then the other thing the last one that I, I thought might be interesting to bring up would be um, our sort of p political and, and, and um, moral obligations so some of the materials that we apply in batteries um, there's not you know no, no stringent child labor laws in some of the countries that we obtain some of these metals from and um, there's big concerns around the ethics of, of, of mining some of these materials and so I think this is an opportunity for scientists and engineers to come up with or design the next generation of, of cathode materials or battery materials in general where we we, we're not overly relying on these 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 metals where there are those sort of ethical challenges around them um, and I think you know th th that will that will come with with looking at sustainability of materials so moving to much more earth abundant elements like for example manganese or iron and um, so I hope I've I've covered that question yeah <laughs> I think there's lots of things <laughs> yeah uh, we have another question here that uh, weight is obviously a problem. Can you see any ways for the reduction in weight of batteries? Yes, so um, obviously when, when you want to, to put these battery packs into cars, you don't want to be adding huge weights to, to, your, to your vehicle. Um, I think weight is an important issue. Um, and so we do try to minimise the amount of additional materials that are going into batteries. But I think even more important than weight is volume, um, mm. because when you have, you know, a car or a portable electronic device, you, every, we want these things to be much smaller, and we want our battery packs to take up much less room. So I think that volumetric energy densities are are, are really important, um, and trying to minimise those, whether that's through trying to come up with new geometries of your primary particles that are going into your battery and how you can uh, pack you know get more bang for your buck right pack more of that material into your battery so coming up with um ways of being able to um grow very thick electrodes for example these these might give you opportunities for trying to improve your volumetric en energy densities and so not taking up huge amounts of space in your car or or allowing for more more battery cells to be added into your pack mm, yeah I think Just I think there's this huge engineering. Sorry, there's huge engineering challenges there too. Like, so my focus is really, you know, I, I love thinking about the the chemistry of what's going on and and the interfaces and the you know how to make new things and discovering new materials. But there is, you know, simultaneously going on a huge amount of engineering expertise going into how do you put all these cells together so that they do take up the smallest amount of space, but they're still safe, and that you manage sort of um, heat transport across. Uh, your your battery cell and so I think you know I said it at the very beginning that this is a challenge that no one um, discipline can claim because it requires knowledge from across multiple areas of, of chemistry engineering and um, also social sciences which we touched on briefly when when you're talking about you know public perception mm -hmm. but I think this is it's such a it, it's such a fantastic area to work in because you do talk to uh, experts from across all of those fields and it really broadens your horizons and your understanding of this is this is a very highly complex um, challenge to overcome and it does require all of that additional know-how. Mm, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, if you think back on your time as an undergrad compared to now, do you think we've made much progress in terms of diversity in chemistry or STEM? Um, that is a really fantastic question. I was an undergrad some time ago, so I think the answer to the question is yes, uh, we have. Um, I think that rate of change is slow, um, and so I, I think that if we really want to tackle the, um, the sort of equality issue um, and diversity issue as well, I think we have to take much more strident um, action uh, because if we keep going at, at the, the rate that we're going, it's just going to happen so slowly. And ideally, by the time my kids are going to college, if, if they choose to go to college, 
it would be great that they show up to um, a university where it's not um, unusual to see a female professor um, or anybody from sort of an underrepresented community it's, um, or, or, uh, or part of our, our, our scientific community. Um, and I think that we really, we really do have to work as, as, as a team, as a community to try to, first of all, reflect on what is stopping this change from happening. Um, and if we can understand that, maybe we can try and tackle it um, in, in a way that brings people with us, right? I, it, I, think, I think it requires that everybody uh, works together and that everybody is feeling like their voices are being heard um, and that they're, you know, they're, they're that everybody feels valued. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I, I, I had several female lecturers and, and, and professors in my department. And um, so I, I was, it was never in my mind that this wasn't going to be a career opportunity for me. I, I always thought that um, my sex was never going to be a determining factor in that. And I think I was really, really uh, privileged to be at a university where uh, the female academics were were very clear on that. They they shared. They were very very generous with not just their scientific knowledge but their experience. And so that's something that I've tried to continue because they taught me so well to do that. Um, at the moment, I'm in a department where there's a large number of female professors, um, and it's uh, a very diverse place to work. But you know, in terms of people's uh, experience but also their 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 knowledge and their know-how and I feel like I'm in a, a place where um, when I'm in that sort of pool of, of, of knowledge I'm learning so much from people because people have had such different experiences and so that's why I I thought it was important today to sort of cover some of the equality stuff because it is so important um, to try to to try to achieve that um, so that everybody benefits from from having this diverse pool of experience and expertise. Yeah. So uh, we've had a question from somebody who says that they're an anthropologist and environmentalist, and they said much of the interesting technology you detailed was lost on them. But they had a question about the long term storage potential for these types of battery systems to store power that's generated by wind or solar. What's the state of play now? And when can we expect major changes? That sounds like a fantastic question. If, if so, um, this is really, really important, right? So when you have intermittent um, energy conversion uh, processes like wind or tidal or solar, um, you know, the sun unfortunately doesn't always shine in the UK. Um, the wind doesn't always blow, uh, but you know, you want to be able to store that energy so that um, or convert and store that energy so that it is available to you at times when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. And there is um, a, a, a huge amount going on already in, um, try, in finding methods for storing this, this kind of energy, um, whether it's chemically through batteries, um, whether it's uh, through more mechanical methods, um, or whether it's through uh, application of, of fuel cell capacitors, um, or even uh, there's you know a growing interest in in things like synthetic fuels, uh, where of course chemistry has a huge role to play. I think what will be really interesting in in the coming years uh, will be trying to integrate fully integrate chemical uh, energy storage and conversion into whether or not that 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 exists as individual components where you have a solar cell. And then you you somehow are able to to take that um, uh, ener energy that's been converted and then transfer you have it, have it stored in a chem in a chemical form in a battery, or whether you can start to develop smart functional inorganic materials that can that can be combined in a single device where you don't have an interface between these two anymore, and you can start to really improve the efficiencies of these these devices. I think that there's a huge amount to be done in that space, um, and there is an awful lot ongoing already. And what we've what we have in the UK, of course, is a huge amount of expertise and experience across all of these um, areas, whether it's wind or, or tidal or, or solar or batteries, um, both in academia but also in industry. And, and we have 
avenues through which people in, in uh, who are working sort of at the, the forefront of, of fundamental research are speaking regularly to people who are actually applying these technologies uh, commercially. And so you're really starting to understand what the challenges are that industry are facing if you want to roll out these things commercially. And I think, you know, this is something that I mentioned the Faraday Institution previously. This is something that, that they do fantastically well, that, you know, there is this sort of liaison between academic research groups and in, interested industry partners where you're actually talking about the, what the roadblocks are to a technology. And I think that goes some way to answering the question asked about um, where we'll be or where, what the pro progress will be. And I think pro progress will be accelerated by more of those kinds of interactions between industry and academia. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much for your talk this evening. It was really absolutely fascinating, an area that I hardly know anything about, if I'm totally honest, but it was very, very interesting. Um, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to the uh, RSC Newcastle and North East Coast local section for uh, helping particularly to Russell for introducing me to Serena and um, the other groups that have been involved in this series who've each hosted their own event as part of the uh, the Women in STEM series, the Littonville for hosting us for the first two events um, and then helping us promote the, the final four online events. Uh, you and Preston for the amazing graphics. If you found us on social media, the, the amazing pictures that you saw were all produced by you and he's absolutely fantastic and he, he did it all. Um, he was part of the group that did the first talk and um, he took it on to do the rest of the series out of the goodness of his heart. So that was hugely appreciated. Um, and yeah, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, like I said earlier, if you did want to catch up on other talks, we'll make sure they're all on the engineering together YouTube page next week. So thank you and good night. Thank you.